Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Veterinary Focus Week. And we are touching on all kinds of different topics this week, taking a bit of a deeper dive into how the veterinary profession is changing, how it has changed over the past couple of decades. Um, a lot of it is not for the better. And so today I have my good friend, Dr. Loudon, and she has a really interesting career. She is in Long Island and she graduated from uh, Ross University down in St. Kitts. Man, smart people going to the islands to get an it's education. Great. <laughs> it's warm. Oh, what? They didn't have that when I went to school. It was so great. But, <laughs> but then she uh, finished out at Oklahoma State University and she's done all kinds of things. A one year internship at Atlantic Coast Veterinary Specialist in Emergency and Surgery, Chief of Emergency Medicine at the Veterinary Medical Center of Long Island for eight years, Medical Director of uh, Nassau Suffolk Animal Hospital for a couple of years, Medical Director Animal Emergency Services, Founder of Healing Haven Animal Foundation, Owner of Peaceful Transitions Home Euthanasia, which is amazing, and um, also does uh, emergency and surgery work. So really, really cool stuff that she's doing. So Dr. Loudon, thank you very much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Love it. So yeah, we actually met at uh, one of the Naturally Healthy Pets experiences, the one we had up in New Jersey. And it was sort of like you meet somebody and you're like instantly go, you're my tribe. Yes, you're my people. <laughs> <laughs> I felt the same way. Yeah, so it's it's very cool, and we really appreciate that when we find people in our tribe. So we actually were going to discuss in home euthanasia, and we are going to touch on that. We'll we'll flip over to that at the end. But I had another topic that I wanted to talk about this week, and so we were having a conversation before we we started recording, and I I discovered that we both had the same thoughts on this. So what I am discovering is that so many new graduates have zero surgery experience and have no desire to do surgery once they graduate. And so yeah. you said you're sort of seeing the same thing. Yeah, I am. A, a lot aren't um, as gung ho, you know, to learn. Uh, I, I knew that that was part of being a vet when I got out and I, I made a conscious decision that I was going to get the experience I needed to to get comfortable and get the tissue handling. Um, and I find that a lot of vets are backing off and saying, I don't have to do it. Um, I'll get hired without that skill. So I'm going to take blows a me different away. road. Yeah. Was, you know, and so it makes this me goes, sad too. <laughs> it does. And it, it kind of fits in with what I am talking about in another session this week, which is corporate versus private veterinary medicine. And so if you own a, so I owned two small animal hospitals and for a long time it was just me. And then uh, usually I had at least one associate, sometimes two. And at the beginning, everybody was did everything. You know, everyone was cross trained to do everything. Everybody did surgery, and what I I graduated, you know, back in the dark ages, forty years ago, and not doing surgery wasn't an option. If you didn't want to mm -hmm. do surgery, you went and got an internship in uh, dermatology or radiology mm -hmm. or something. Yeah. It was just it was just expected, and in order to get hired in a small animal practice, you needed to be mm -hmm. able to do surgery. Yeah, it was a requirement. You need to be yeah. comfortable. Yeah. And I, I mean, I never backed off. And then you, one of the things that you said is um, you're seeing that if they want, because you've done a lot of training for interns in emergency medicine. Mm -hmm. And so how did you approach that when you got these interns in? Were they required to do surgery? Yeah, I did make it a requirement. I, I set it up for them where they would, um, have an opportunity to do spays and neuters and, and other small uh, procedures like enucleations, removing an eye, things like that at a local shelter nearby. Um, because I wanted them coming out of that year with experience, you know, and I, I'm mentoring someone right now who's fresh out of school and I'm setting that up for her as well. Um, because that's what I did. When I got out of school, I started my internship and then I 
became chief of ER pretty quickly. And I was like, all right, I need to be a surgeon. Because back then I was, I had to do emergency surgeries. I was doing bloat exactly. surgeries. And so I was like, all right, I got to, I got to get good. I got to get great at this. Exactly. So no matter what, every week I was in the shelter doing spays, neuters, and small procedures just to get that tissue handling for yep. For at least three years, in my first three years out of school, I did that. Um, and the yeah, and, and I did emergency medicine for ten years, and and I was doing it in addition to regular small animal practice too. Uh-huh. But it was partly because I just really enjoyed it. I had that you know sort of take type A you know yeah me too frenetic energy. Mm-hmm. Um, and back then the emergency service was one doctor. I had a bunch of technicians, Mm -hmm. but it was one doctor. So it wasn't like I could call in a surgeon. And I I will never forget, it was like my second night there, I had a gastric torsion come in, which is bloat. Mm -hmm. So this huge dog with a bloat, I'd never done the surgery. It's a hard surgery. And it's hard. Yeah. So um, I actually called the owner of the clinic in at two o'clock in the morning and I said, I am so sorry. I have never done this. I don't want to screw it up. Mm -hmm. And he came in and kind of walked me through it and the dog did great and it was fine. Um, But I had never done it. And then, you know, another night I had to open up a dog was bleeding in its abdomen. It had a ruptured tumor on its kidney. I had never taken out a kidney, but guess what? It's three o'clock in the morning. You're the only doctor. Out. <laughs> You're going to figure it out. My technicians yeah. were really good about getting the textbooks and saying, okay, <laughs> step one. <laughs> yeah. I, I did but, the same thing. I went into an abdomen <laughs> thinking it was a spleen and it was a kidney. And I was like, okay, we're taking out a kidney today. Right, Luckily, we're figuring it wasn't that hard, but yeah. No, it wasn't. It and, and interestingly, about 10 years later, somebody came to me from another local practice and her dog had a kidney tumor and needed to have it removed. And somewhere along the line, somebody said, oh, take it to Dr. Morgan. She's very brave. She'll, you know, she'll do Mm -hmm. just about any surgery. And, you know, so thankfully I had done that in the Mm -hmm. ER. Um, And, you know, I did the surgery for, she couldn't afford to go to a specialty center because it was going to cost four times as much. And I said, no, I'll do it for you. And that's Um, where the tissue handling comes in because if you're, even if you're just just doing space, it's no different. You'll figure it out. (laughs) You know, if you have to, if you get that practice in. Yeah, we um, we were lucky. One of my clinics was a mile away from the county shelter and the county shelter had contracts with because they didn't have any surgery site there. So they had contracts with veterinarians in the county who would give them reduced pricing and do spay neuter. So every Wednesday, their van would pull up and they would drop off 20 animals, cats, dogs, boys, girls. Mm -hmm. And um, so with all of my new graduates, I was like, guess what you're doing every Wednesday, because this is how you're going to get more and more comfortable. But I think that a lot of the problem that we're seeing is they're not doing any tissue handling in schools. They are are not doing any live animal surgeries while they are in veterinary school. And I, I get where this comes from. Um, it's all about, you know, animal cruelty and not doing anything to harm animals. But I mean, like I said, I graduated 40 years ago. So our junior surgery class, we had a surgery goat and a surgery dog, and we had to do limb amputations. We had to do eye enucleations. We had to do disc surgeries. We had to do intestinal anastomosis. We had to do spay and neuter. We had to do dentals. Uh, and they they don't allow that anymore. I get it. I understand it. Uh, the the good news is, almost all junior vet students graduated owning a one eyed three legged dog because yeah. <laughs> everybody adopted their dogs mm-hmm. because we all felt really bad. And I understand why they they don't do that. But then, as a new graduate, you walk into a practice. So now you have somebody's beloved pet in front of you and you're expected to do surgery. And I think you're already terrified when you get out of vet school, right? (laughs) Like you're like, oh my God, I'm a doctor now. And, and, and you're freaked out then to start the surgery journey on top of that. I can see how that can be overwhelming. And if it's an option not to, I can understand why they might take that path. I feel like there must be a happy medium though in vet school where 
they can have the opportunity to do spays and neuters and procedures that have to be done, you know? Right. Yeah. I mean, wouldn't it make more sense if the veterinary schools did a contract thing like we had with our local shelter and where shelter animals, I mean, we had a local shelter in New Jersey where the veterinarian that was on staff for the shelter, let's say somebody needed a splenectomy or they needed an amputation or something and they couldn't afford it, they could go to that shelter and get it done for next to nothing Mm -hmm. by the shelter veterinarian. So why can't the veterinary schools figure out some way for these students to, you know, and I get that they're busy doing all the referral high-end cases, Mm -hmm. but as a student, those referral high-end cases, you never touch any tissue. You're lucky. You're in the so background, you know, trying yeah, to peek got, in. You've got your surgeon, your anesthesiologist, a couple of yeah. residents, uh, you know, you've got first, second and third year resident and intern. Mm-hmm. And then there's that student somewhere, you know, five rows deep standing back there. Exactly. If you're lucky, you might get to hand somebody an instrument. Yeah. yeah. Not a good way and, and to learn. And that would be solving two problems, wouldn't it? Because how many animals are getting euthanized every year because guardians can't afford the surgeries? Right. Um, That's what my nonprofit Healing Haven is for, because I wasn't going to euthanize animals due to finances. Awesome. Um, So that would be solving two problems. The, the, The vet students are getting the experience they need and those animals aren't losing their lives for treatable conditions. You know what? I think their answer is going to be funding. Yeah. Who's paying for that? Yeah. But you know what? They get a lot of funding. And I, I think that um, they could look at the resources and say, maybe mm-hmm. we need to spend a little more time. I mean, what is what is going to happen? So we're going more and more and more corporate. Mm-hmm. And we're, we're having more and more students who say, I never want to do surgery. And it's interesting because over the years of working in different practices and then owning practices mm-hmm. and hiring veterinarians, that was never – an issue for the first two and a half decades of my practice. Yeah. And it's only in about the last decade that we have this huge issue with, no, I never want to do surgery. Mm -hmm. And what options is this going to leave for pet parents? Like you said, that, that, you know, financial euthanasia, if we're not training these students to do surgery and they don't feel comfortable doing surgery and the only option for the pet parent, I did a TV interview a couple months ago. Uh, somebody had a large dog, middle-aged, and it had a pyometra, an infected uterus, and uh, they were sent to a specialty center and the quote was $7,000. Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, yeah, and our specialty clinics here, you're not going to get one of these surgeries under 10 on Long Island. Yeah. So, yeah, the guy did find somebody else to do it for 1500 mm-hmm. Unfortunately, it had a bad ending. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I, I think that we are allowing the veterinary profession to get away from us. And uh, I forget what the statistic is. It's like 75% of the specialty and emergency clinics in this country are owned by Mars. So when you have a monopoly, you can charge whatever Mm -hmm. you want. Yeah. Yeah. And they don't give them other options, you know? No. It's, it's that or euthanasia or you, you walk out the door and it's, it's really sad and upsetting. Well, I think we need to figure out how to get these students more comfortable with surgery. Um, I read an article not too long ago, uh, just probably a few weeks ago, uh, basically saying that these students never do any live surgeries before graduation. They don't handle tissue. They and and I, if there are veterinary students or new graduates who watch this, and you have a different perspective, or you did have a really good education on on surgery. Let me know. Let me know, you know, where you went to school, how you got that training. Was it something there, – there are some things in vet school that you have to do on your own. So, for instance, we had a special weekend um, with Dr. Lefebvre, the bird guy. Mm-hmm. He came in and did a whole weekend really intensive on birds. 
and we had all these little parakeets. I ended up with about 20 parakeets at the end of the week. <laughs> and of course, they all had deformed beaks and, you know, like all the, all those, like no they feathers. got all those ones with problems. I know it was a mess. Um, so, but if you wanted to learn bird medicine, that wasn't part of the regular curriculum. Mm-hmm. You had to do it on the side, but I, I don't feel like surgery should no. be a specialty thing that you have to I do. Agree. I mean, we had, we had to take multiple surgery rotations. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like and we had, I had the same thing. We had a donkey, a, a, um, a goat and, and a dog and a cat and it, it was difficult. You know, it was, it was upsetting, but we did learn what we needed to do. And I've saved so many animals because of that one animal. Do I, and I never forget them. And I am right. still always grateful for them and for the learning I got from them. And I've taken that with me through 21 years of saving other animals. So, yeah, I, I you know, I, I think it's very daunting, you know, and and the other thing is something is going to go wrong. You're going to lose an animal mm-hmm. in surgery at some point something is going to go wrong. I lost a six month old dog on a routine spay, uh, probably about six months into my career. And it is one of those things where you go, Oh my gosh, Mm -hmm. like, I don't know if I can do this anymore. And ours was a, it was a, it wasn't a surgical problem. It was a malfunctioning anesthesia machine. And the technician didn't catch it. Of course, I'm also going back 40 years and we didn't have the monitoring mm-hmm. equipment and, you know, all of the gadgets and bells and whistles that we have now. So I feel like um, surgery is so much safer, but we we need our veterinarians trained to do this. It's really critical yeah. for the care of our pets. It really is. It really is. And more animals are going to get euthanized because they can't make it to that specialty clinic for a surgeon or they can't afford that level of care. Yeah. Um, sad. Well, and even finding one. So one of our cats broke his leg on a Friday morning, mm-hmm. needed surgery because he needed pins and wires and all kinds of things. Um, it took my veterinarian three hours to find somebody who was willing to do it. And we drove three hours each way to get it done. Oh, wow. So um, because that was the closest one we could find who was willing to do surgery. Mm-hmm. Really, really crazy. Um so I, I don't think that we're headed in a good direction. So with that said, and you just brought up a good point, you uh, own Peaceful Transitions Home Euthanasia yeah. since 2018. What got you into that? You know, I was, I've always done emergency. I was doing emergency full time. And a friend of mine asked me to come help her friend who had a Wheaton Terrier who was at the end of his life, but he was a very reactive dog. And she said, if we have to take him into the clinic, it's going to be a disaster for everybody, but especially for him. He's going to have to be wrestled and he's going to be muzzled. And I said, oh, sure, of course I'll do it. And so I came into the house and um, I, I, I had them set up. I said, put some nice music on, light some candles if you want. I came in, he's curled up in his bed, his family kids that grew up with him all over. I get chills just talking about it. Family surrounding his bed. He he looked up at me. He put his head back down in his bed. I sat with him. I let our energies meet. And I I put a catheter in and I gave him some propofol. There was no resistance. There was no struggle. There was no fear. And he went with love. And I was like, I have to do this. I have to keep doing this. (laughs) And so... I, I did it on the side. You know, I, I worked full time in the yard, ER, worked crazy hours like you, you know. Um, so I, I just did it when I could. I did it through people who knew me and, and, and things. And then after COVID, it, it really, I got a lot more people asking for it. And I also didn't want to do, you know, the amount of hours I was doing in the ER when I got that taste of being home with my young boys. So I was like, all right, I'm going to offer this more and and focus and build this business. And it, you know, it's been a beautiful opportunity for me. Everyone says, you know, how can you do that? And um, I actually, it's an honor to do it. I I sit in rooms filled with love and I see a journey of a dog with a family and I get to be part of that. 
And I get to make sure that their end is a beautiful one. And I think it's a privilege and it's not something that makes me, you know, I'll have tears on my way home sometimes, sure, but I st- it doesn't make me feel like, oh, this is what I'm doing. I-, I-, I just have a totally different perspective on it. And there are so many like you, so many veterinarians, that that is the only thing that they're doing. And it does require that mindset of this is a privilege and I'm helping. And it, it, because of that, it's it's not sad. Yes, there may be tears, but... Um, it, I don't think it does weigh heavily on your soul, yeah. but you do have to have the right personality for it. And you absolutely do. Um, I did a few for my special clients and uh, I, I didn't, I, I didn't get the warm fuzzies <laughs> from it. I mean, I knew I was helping and I liked helping them, but for me, I knew it wasn't something that I wanted to be doing day in and day out. Um, we have a couple of practices that that's all they do here uh, yeah. where we live. Um, and I think it's such a, it's such a great service for people. Um, you know, and I think that especially during COVID people were reaching out for that more because they weren't allowed yeah. in with their mm-hmm. pets. And, you know, t- t- that was one of the hardest things I ever did was telling people, yeah, you have to just drop your pet mm-hmm. off at the door for terrible. their euthanasia. I ended up, you know, out in people's Me cars. Too. If the weather was decent, I outside was outside on the grass. Under a tree. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I did outside under our tree at our office quite often for some of my, my really good clients because um, it was just a, a much better setting yeah. for them, particularly if the animals were afraid. But um, so I think it's a, a great service. And uh, I would I would encourage people um, to see if that service does exist in your area. Is there a is there a um, a group like, is there a website for veterinarians that that's all they do? Do you know of anything? Because I, I don't. No, I don't think there is. Like, I know Lap of Love is, is like a, a huge, huge mm-hmm. franchise, mm-hmm. basically. So there's a lot of those yeah. around. So that would be one one thing to look for. But I think, um, and frankly, if you have a veterinarian for your pets, they should be able to, um, like I know in our veterinary office, I saw a little pamphlet there the other day mm-hmm. uh, for somebody that does do house call euthanasias. Um, yeah, and I would encourage I people if they're going to look for a house call vet, you know, maybe start to look before it's yeah. it's imminent, you know. Um, get get to talk to a couple of different vets because there's all different types of us, right? There's me who, yeah. uh, this is one of my businesses that I'm devoted to. Um, and I've, I've mastered that skill set. I know exactly what I'm doing every time I go in. Then there's the vets who just want to make a little extra money and they're not invested. They're like, let me just, you know, grab some tools and go and get out of there as fast as possible. And that's not what you want. Um, no, so, and there are quite a few who, um, actually offer hospice and palliative Mm -hmm. care. So you could reach out if your animal is getting older and you're thinking, uh, you know, I don't want to do any more heroics. I'm not going to do chemo, radiation, yes. amputation, surgery, whatever. And I, I want to know how to keep my pet comfortable. Do I need to be able to give sub-Q fluids at home? Do I need to be able to give pain medications? Um, so it's very – and I, I have quite a few friends who that's – all they do is – house call, mm-hmm. hospice and palliative care, and, and in-home euthanasia. And that can be uh, a really good transitioning yeah. journey. Um, to, to You get to you know, know the vet. Un- and- yeah. And unfortunately, so many practices have gone to, these are our strict rules. Mm-hmm. And in order for your pet to come in, they have to be up to date on 17 mm-hmm. vaccines. Well, he's got cancer and he's dying. And I really don't want to give him 17 vaccines right now. Um, but then they'll refuse to see them. Whereas if you're working with somebody with hospice, palliative care, and in-home euthanasia, they're not going to tell you you have to do those crazy things. Yeah. Uh, they're not going to tell you you have to do, uh, you know, a boatload of blood work before they'll refill the prescriptions. Mm-hmm. It's like, no, we're, we're just, just keeping, keeping them, them comfortable. comfortable. Yeah. We're, we're just easing the transition. So um, I, w- I would strongly recommend that if someone is in that situation, that uh, looking for someone like that would be 
And I don't think we have a specific veterinary group for hospice and palliative care. No, there's certifications, but I don't, but not an actual Right, but I don't group, think, yeah. you know, like we have the mm-hmm. AHVMA for the holistic vets and we have the Botanical Veterinary Medical Association for the herbalists. Yeah. But I don't, I don't know if there is a specific group for yeah. that. Although new ones keep coming up all the time, so yeah. who knows? Um, but if we find that information, we'd be happy to post it because it's it would be a really good resource. Um, but your local veterinarian should know if there's anybody in the area doing that that sort of service. And it's good too. I, I do find a lot of um, dog guardians maybe are unsure of is it time um, or when to make the decision. I do find some who maybe are making it a little too soon, and 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 I'll talk them through it, and we'll make a plan, and and then I'll. I end up seeing them a year later, you know, um, there you go. or there's some that maybe took it a little bit too long. And I'd, I'd rather that than too soon, but talk to a euthanasia vet, just find a hospice vet and, and just get that information um, so that you're more comfortable when you're making that really tough decision. Yep. It is a tough one. Yeah. But very much needed. Well, thank you very much for all you're doing. Um, yeah, you, I didn't, I didn't realize how much you have done in your <laughs> career. It's kind of amazing. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, you've, you've risen to pretty great heights in 20 oh, years. That's very, thank very you cool. So much. But, you know, I'm, I, it's funny because I, uh, when students first started coming out of Ross University, I was like, mm, mm-hmm. I don't know <laughs> about this. And I got to tell you, the students that I've met coming or the veterinarians that I've met coming out of Ross, Lots of hands-on mm-hmm. real-world experience, and that is so lacking sometimes. Yeah. It's like you can – interestingly, the person who was second in our class for the first three years, the fourth year when we had to go on clinics, it was a train wreck yeah. because there there were no skills. And she actually, after graduation, never practiced wow. as a veterinarian because – you know, it was great as long as it was all book knowledge, but the actual application handling, mm-hmm. um, you know, just which is a shame when you see somebody who gets that far along yeah. in their career. And it's like, wow, you might have might have wanted to spend a little more time in a vet mm-hmm. clinic before you got yeah. here. <laughs> yeah. We're a, a Very expensive are curve. <laughs> you are. You are. My local veterinarian here, man, she is scrappy and she will do <laughs> anything that we put in front of her. And uh, I'll ask her, have you ever done this surgery? No. Would you like to do it? Okay. Yeah, let's do it. Let's <laughs> and she's it just out. game. Uh <laughs> Love and that, that that was my personality, and that's that's how I always looked at things. And the thing is, once you do your first bloat surgery, it's like, okay, mm-hmm. bring them on. You take out a kidney, okay, yeah. bring them on. Um, and so, and and I I frankly think that uh, everybody should have to spend a year in an emergency mm-hmm. clinic because you see so much, and you get exposed to so much, and you learn yeah. so yeah. much. I I did it. Um, I lost my job for being pregnant. Mm. You could do that in 1989. Um, And so when I had my son, I took three months off and then I was broke. So I started doing relief work. And one of the relief jobs that I picked up was an emergency clinic about an hour from my house. And I got hired on very quickly and absolutely loved it. So I stayed there for 10 years, even though at that Mm -hmm. point I was, you know, working for other clinics, opening my own yeah. clinic. And I was like, but this is so it cool. Is. I love it. I love the rush. I love being the one they really need at that point, you know? Um, exactly. And I have to say, I've, uh, a lot of my employees later on, my friends were people that I met working in that emergency, yeah. coming in as clients or working with them there. Um, you know, just made really great relationships because uh, it that is a time when people are in yes. crisis. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, you don't want to be combative mm-hmm. with some, there's, you know, it's, it's very, emergency medicine is hard because the clients are freaked out. You're not their regular veterinarian. You don't know anything about mm-hmm. their animal. Um, and you've got to fix yeah, their problem. Yeah, they're usually <laughs> in a state, right? An emotional state. Yeah. Um, and that's perspective too. I decided when I was, you know, chief of VR, I was like, all right, I got to love dealing with difficult clients. And so I chose to, all right, I'm going to turn them every time I'd go into a room, I'm going to make them comfortable. I'm going to make them trust me because I need them to trust me to be able to save their pet. Um, and then, uh, you know, 
I loved, I got to love that as much as I loved saving the pet is helping the, the, the guardian through that crisis. Yeah. It's a, yeah. I mean, they're, they're freaked out that their animal is really ill or hurt, freaked out that they mm-hmm. have a huge bill in front it's of unexpected. them. It's unexpected. Freaked out that they didn't plan, they didn't plan yeah. for any of this. Yeah. 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 It's, it's a, it's a tough job, but I, I actually, I absolutely loved it. Yeah. So I couldn't do it anymore. Now, it, <laughs> now you walk into an emergency service and it's like, oh, <laughs> you don't do the surgery. It gets sent over to the surgeon. Oh, you don't do the ultrasound. It gets sent over yeah. to the radio. Like there's, it's, it's, different. it's just like, I, I'm lucky. It's I, very I, I different. still do Mondays. Uh, I do one day a week, but it's like a 16 hour day. It ends up being ridiculous, but just to stay in yeah. it. And I work at an E it's only ER. So I still do all the things, yeah. which is I'm lucky to do. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. Well, thank you very much for thank your time. You so Go much. play with your animals and your kids. Yes. And- <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your day. And we really appreciate everything that you are doing. Oh, thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you.